Greetings, Mother Factors! I'm Chris. And I'm Georgia. And sadly, Sam has had to go in for repairs because he's actually a robot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a conspiracy. I'm not doing conspiracies part three. You can't make me. All right, all right. We're not doing that. But poor old Sam has had to go in for some repairs. So instead, you have us. Yeah, I know you all love Sam, but come on, we're good too. Oh, they're going to hate us, aren't they? Yeah. But aside from that, today we're going to be talking to you all about the King of Monsters himself, or herself, we'll get to that. Either way, it's Godzilla. The big lizard who has crossed continents, been a villain, a hero, had some facelifts, and starred in one 1998 film we'll try to talk about as little as humanly possible. Speaking of movies though, you guys should totally check out our friends over at All Time Movies. They've got fact videos, crazy cinematic theories, and top 10 lists out the wazoo! It's a brilliant word. So head on over and said Chris sent you. But which Godzilla film made Quentin Tarantino cry? Which dictator kidnapped a director to get his own Godzilla ripoff? And does size matter? Two out of these three questions are about to be answered, so power up your atomic breath, grab your Japanese phrase book, and close your windows to keep out Mothras as, as we, we count through 101, 101 facts about, about Godzilla. Godzilla. Number one! Oh. Godzilla is a fictional prehistoric amphibious reptile introduced to the world in the 1954 film Godzilla. He's awakened and powered by nuclear radiation from H-bomb tests, but was also written as a metaphor for nuclear weapons, meaning he literally interacts with the things he's an allegory for, like if Superman had to fight Jesus. Number two! The name comes from a blend of the English word gorilla and the Japanese word for whale, which is Kujira, which you can't imagine would be a very effective predator, would it be a hairy, limbless landfish or just a giant drowning monkey? Either way, just take my money. Number three. It's widely believed that the name Godzilla came from an employee of Japan's Toho Studios, who was nicknamed Gorilla Whale for his large stature. However, no photos exist of the legendary human Godzilla and no one has come forward, so it's believed to be a myth. I choose to believe. Number four. Godzilla is probably the most famous example of a kaiju, a Japanese film genre that features giant monsters usually attacking cities and fighting against the military and other massive oversized monsters. Kaiju have taken the form of enormous birds, dinosaurs, insects, dragons, and even robots. So that's fun. Number 5. One of the film's biggest inspirations was the 1953 American sci-fi monster film The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, which featured stop-motion animation from the legendary Ray Harryhausen an American-born British artist, designer, animator, and visual effects creator. Harryhausen has since inspired numerous celebrated filmmakers and animators, including Tim Burton, James Cameron, Nick Park, Steven Spielberg, and Guillermo del Toro. Number 6. Early storyboard drawings of the King of Monsters actually had him designed as a large, mutated octopus. But producer Tomoyuki Tanaka opted for the drier dinosaur-esque design that we know and love today. Number 7. Oh, my glasses. One of the most famous behind the scenes legends from the original film has its director, this guy, and special effects artist, that guy, on the observation deck of one of Tokyo's many skyscrapers, which they were using as a helpful vantage point to plan Godzilla's path of destruction through the city. As they talked about the impending yet crucially fictional devastation, other visitors who overheard their conversation became genuinely concerned and reported them, leading the pair to be stopped by authorities and questioned. Number 8. Inspired by the abjectly gloomy subject of nuclear bombs, Godzilla's scaly skin was intended to be reminiscent of the keloid scar tissue found on many of the survivors of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings that took place just nine years before the film's release. Yeesh, that's grim. Number 9. Godzilla was originally intended to be brought to life using the stop-motion animation used for the original King Kong. But the process was deemed too expensive and special effects director, this guy, you remember him, opted for a bloke in a suit instead. Number 10. The first Godzilla suit they designed was made with appearance in mind, and no one paid much attention to the fact someone was going to have to wear the thing. It ended up weighing 220 pounds and was virtually impossible to move in. 220 pounds is me and I'm light. Oh, look at me, I'm Chris. I go to the gym and I can lift heavy things. Yeah, I can actually. <laughs> with movement being one of the defining characteristics of Godzilla, the crew were forced to design a more mobile suit. Number 11. Coming out soon, season three. Said new suit was only a slight improvement. It was still incredibly heavy and extremely hot. And as such, it wasn't uncommon for the crew to drain up to a cup of sweat from actor Haru Nakajima after a take. 
That's pretty kinky. Number 12. Godzilla's famous roar was created by composer Akiro Ikafube. After several failed attempts using distorted animal sounds, the signature Godzilla roar was achieved by rubbing a double bass string with a resin-coated leather glove. Which is incidentally my new favourite self-love euphemism. Euphemism? Why do you say it? Euphemism. I've been saying it wrong for 24 years. <laughs> Number 13. Godzilla's introduction in the 1954 original, in which the scaly beast attacks a fishing boat, was also inspired by true events. Just eight months before the film's release, a Japanese tuna fishing boat drifted into the fallout from an American H-bomb test, exposing the 23-person crew to severe radiation poisoning, which served as the inspiration for the film's opening. That's cheery. Number 14. All you haters out there, at least my arm likes me. When the 1954 film was re-released for American audiences, a reporter character was added named Steve Martin. Years later, however, the name Steve Martin became far more associated with the comedian and banjo player Steve Martin. And so when reporter Steve Martin, who doesn't play banjo as far as I know, returned in 1985, he's only referred to as Steve or Mr. Martin. Number 15. With some of its more silly sequels and the somewhat dated appearance of the old costumes, Godzilla has earned a campy reputation. But the first entry was released as a straight-up horror film, with a dark atomic bomb subtext ensuring no one in the cinema was laughing. Number 16. At the time of its release in 1954, the original Godzilla movie was the most expensive Japanese movie ever made at 100 million yen, or roughly 1.5 million dollars. The film took this record from the almost universally acclaimed si seven, seven Samurai, which was also produced by Toho. Number 17. Luckily, the film was a commercial success, earning over 152 million yen upon release in Japan, or around 200, no, 2 million, 2.25 million dollars. That was a lot of money back then, you lazy good-for-nothing millennials. Number 18. Ooh. It's estimated that around 11% of the entire Japanese population went to see the creature feature oh, oh, I like that. during its initial cinema run, constituting over 9 million Japanese moviegoers. That was a lot of moviegoers back then, you vile, entitled, disgusting millennials. God, I hate you. I am one of you. Number 19. That being said, upon its initial release in Japan, Godzilla was met with mostly mixed or negative reviews from critics. Honda later lamented these reactions, stating that critics referred to the film as grotesque junk and said it looked like something you'd spit up. Harsh. Critical assessment of the film has been far more positive, proving once and for all that film critics don't know what they're talking about. Number 20. Regardless of its critical reception, Godzilla had a profound cultural legacy that inspired filmmakers around the world. Perhaps the most notable example is George Lucas, who has cited the original film's miniatures as inspiration for his effects in his iconic Star Wars trilogy. Number 21. The film's commercial success had Toho executives salivating at the thought of an American release, but they weren't sure the name Gojira would be particularly marketable stateside. Thus, the name Godzilla was born. Oh, it's the Taylor Swift number where Sam goes, ooh, to a song that's probably about seven years old by now. Is 22 seven years old? 2012, yeah, seven years old. Oh, the first film in the series was so successful that a sequel was churned out in a fashion that's basically impossible these days. Godzilla Raids Again was scripted, filmed, and released within six months of the first film's release. That's like 1 24th of the time they spent on filming Boyhood, and that film literally didn't have a single dinosaur monster. Number 23. Before he starred as Hikaru Sulu in the celebrated sci-fi series Star Trek, Japanese-American actor George Takei started out dubbing Japanese monster movies for their English-language releases. You can catch Takei's early voice work in the English dub of Godzilla Raids Again, which was released in the US as Gigantis the Fire Monster. Number 24. In 1956, the original Godzilla film was heavily re-edited and adapted for release in the United States under the very American title of Godzilla, King of the Monsters. The film's English screenplay was written by Al C. Ward, who was given a choice between a $2,500 upfront payment for his work or 5% of the profits. Assuming the movie would bomb, Ward took the $2,500, later admitting that he always regretted the decision. Had he taken the 5% offer, Ward could have raked in an estimated $5 million in total. Number 25, you will get a go soon. It's fine, it's 
when Godzilla King of the Monsters was released in Eastern Europe. Anti-Western sentiment at the time prompted some countries to hide the fact that the film was the heavily re-edited American version of the Japanese original and instead advertised the film as being fully produced by Japan. Number 26 American Willis O'Brien, widely regarded as the father of stop-motion animation, spent the winter of his career struggling for work, largely because of the Japanese monster films that took inspiration from his work, but did away with stop-motion. Supposedly, he was trying to sell his idea King Kong vs. Frankenstein when American producer John Beck took the idea to Toho and made the third Godzilla film, King Kong vs. Godzilla, without his knowledge or involvement. How would Frankenstein do any damage to King Kong? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Rah. Number 27. Tragically, O'Brien only found out that his work had been very ripped off when King Kong vs. Godzilla was released in 1962, which allegedly broke his heart shortly before he passed away in the same year. Aforementioned stop animation master Ray Harryhausen was the protege of Willis O'Brien, and as a result, Harryhausen famously hated Japanese monster movies, especially Godzilla, for ripping him off and maybe killing his mentor. Wow, Fact 27's a real downer. Number 28. Amazingly, King Kong vs. Godzilla featured alternative endings made to appeal to the East vs. West tensions of the time. Japanese audiences saw Godzilla win, while viewers in the United States were treated to a Kong victory. Is what an incorrect person would say. This popular tale is in fact totally untrue. In actuality, everyone saw the same ending, where King Kong ultimately takes the W. USA. USA! <laughs> Number 29. During one action sequence in the fourth film in the series, entitled Mothra vs. Godzilla, the head of the Godzilla suit accidentally caught fire. The actor inside was unharmed, and amazingly, this footage was used in the final film. Number 30. The much maligned seventh Zilla flick, originally entitled Ebira, Horror of the Deep, but retitled Godzilla vs. the Sea Monster for the 1968 US release, was originally meant to feature King Kong. But after the studio lost the rights to Mr. Kong well into pre-production, my man Godzilla stepped in to fill his massive boots. Number 31. People keep calling me sir! Unfortunately, this switchery was painfully apparent in the final film with Godzilla behaving weirdly out of character and even having the hots for the female lead. As a result, Godzilla vs. the Sea Monster has earned the legacy of being the fan's least favoured entry in the series. Number 32. The seventh film in the Godzilla series, originally titled Godzilla vs. Hedora, but renamed Godzilla vs. the Smog Monster for the American release, is widely considered one of the weirder films in the Godzilla canon. This is possibly because in the film, Godzilla craftily uses its patented atomic heat ray breath to propel itself through the air, allowing Godzilla to literally fly. Number 33. According to director Yoshimitsu Bano in an interview with the Japanese magazine Aiga Haiho, the eyes of the titular monster in Godzilla vs. the Smog Monster were modeled on Lady Bits. Lady Bits. Lady Bits. <laughs> he literally stated that the reason why this was done was because, and I'm quoting exactly here, vaginas are scary. Absolutely no comment. <laughs> Vaginas are scary! <laughs> Number 34. In the 12th film in the Godzilla series, entitled Godzilla vs. Gigan, Godzilla and his monster ally Aguidas have full blown conversations in distorted English, hilariously accompanied by Japanese subtitles in speech bubbles. The convos between the two monsters include Godzilla saying to Aguidas, Something funny is going on, you better check! And, Aguidas, come on! There's a lot of trouble ahead. Number 35. In the American poster for the 13th Godzilla film, released in 1973 with the title Godzilla vs. Megalon, the titular monsters can be seen duking it out on top of the Twin Towers, despite the fact that neither of them ever set foot in New York. How can the film industry just lie to me like that? It makes me sick. Number 36. The 16th film in the Godzilla series, released in 1984 with the title The Return of Godzilla, was heavily edited and recut for the American release under the slightly amusing title of Godzilla 1985. In the original version of the film, a Soviet soldier makes a valiant attempt to abort the accidental launch of a nuclear missile, but in the American version, the scene was recut to make the launch appear deliberate in order to depict the Soviets as negatively as possible. That's some Cold War propaganda for you right there. Number 37. Still, the political implications of monster-based sci-fi and fantasy films cut both ways. 
Though beloved by fans, the 1991 film Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah was condemned as anti-American by some Western viewers due to a scene set during the Pacific theatre of World War II which showed a troop of US soldiers being massacred at the hands of a giant dinosaur. Director Kazuki Omori defended the film and rejected claims that the film was anti-American. Number 38 at one point in Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah, a US Navy officer sees the time-travelling spacecraft but dismisses the idea of a UFO, joking to one of his subordinates, You can tell your son about this when he's born, Spielberg! Jokingly implying that this moment inspired the celebrated director Steven Spielberg to create his famous sci-fi and fantasy films. Number 39 Still, this obviously fictionalised account of Spielberg's rise to cinematic stardom isn't entirely disconnected from the truth. Spielberg's dad did serve in the Second World War, and the famed director has cited Godzilla as a major influence on his career. Number 40 Of course, who can forget the year 1998, in which the first American Godzilla reboot was released to truly horrific reviews. Toho gave the filmmakers a range of detailed instructions regarding what could and could not be done with their character, which included a specific range of physical requirements for the creature and demands that, among other stipulations, Godzilla could not eat people, only fish, and wasn't to be made to look silly. Apparently, most of these directions were almost entirely disregarded. Number 41 Godzilla's colour scheme in the film was based on the urban environment of New York which was done with the idea that the monster would be able to blend in better with its environment. The meaning of life is what do you do? Apparently, there was enough paint used on the film to repaint the entire Golden Gate Bridge. That is, if you'd want to paint one of the world's most iconic architectural achievements in a mucky greyish colour. Go baby, go baby, go! Number 43 is go! <laughs> Director Roland Emmerich based the squabbling Mayor Ebert and his aide Gene on the movie critics Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel, after receiving poor reviews from the pair for several of his previous movies. Considering the film's poor critical performance, one would imagine that Ebert and Siskel had the last laugh. <laughs> Number 44 J.D. Lees, the founder and editor of the Godzilla fan magazine, G-Fan, instigated considerable opposition to the film and harshly criticised it in various writings during its production. In response, Emmerich included a lookalike of Lees in the film, who was the first character to be killed by Godzilla. I'm starting to get the feeling that Roland Emmerich enjoys the odd spot of petty revenge. <laughs> Number 45 The 1998 reboot, entitled simply Godzilla, starred actor Hank Azaria, known for voicing numerous iconic characters in the near-legendary American cartoon series The Simpsons. Near-legendary? It is legendary. It's, it's been on for 30 years. Interestingly enough, the film also starred two of his Simpsons co-stars, Harry Shearer and Nancy Cartwright, as employees at a television station. Number 46 In November of 1997, six months prior to the film's release, Fruit of the Loom lost their license to sell any Godzilla-related apparel after it was discovered that the company had leaked images of Godzilla online. The images in question were in fact unique fakes released by the studio in an effort to figure out which companies they could trust to not leak the images to the public. That's right, Fruit of the Loom, you just played yourself. Well, not just, in 1997. But still, you done goofed. You done goofed. Number 47. Upon its release, the film was nominated for five Razzies at the 1998 Golden Raspberry Awards, which are awards given to honour the lack of excellence in cinema. Godzilla won two Razzie Awards, the first for Worst Remake or Sequel, and the second for Maria Patillo as Worst Supporting Actress, and also received nominations for Worst Picture, Worst Director, and Worst Screenplay. Number 48 So hated was the 1998 reboot that fans nicknamed the monster G-I-N-O, standing for Godzilla in name only. Wow, people really hated this film. Like, really hated it. Number 49 the band Blue Oyster Cult released a parody of their 1977 song Godzilla, entitled Nozilla, in apparent annoyance that their original song wasn't included on the film's soundtrack. I mean, to be fair, it is an obvious choice, but then again, the soundtrack did have some legit bangers, Deeper Underground by Jamiroquai being the standout example. Great music video too. We're getting sidetracked, moving on. Number 50. To distance itself from the American version of Godzilla, Toho officially refers to the monster from the 1998 film as Zilla, 
According to frequent Godzilla producer Shogo Tomiyama, this was done because the 1998 reboot took the god out of Godzilla. I feel like you should roar. <laughs> But do you even agree that the 1998 reboot was as bad as everyone said it was? Perhaps you liked the apparently godless Zilla? Let us know in our beastly YouTube poll! Number 51 uh, In 2001, Toho released their 25th Godzilla film, lengthily titled Godzilla, Mothra and King Ghidorah, Giant Monsters All Out Attack. In the film, the Japanese military references a monster similar to Godzilla that ravaged New York at the end of the last century. An obvious burn on the 1998 American reboot, which again, pretty much everyone hated. Number 52. Toho continued its open mockery of Zilla in Godzilla Final Wars, the 20th film in the series released in 2004. In the film, the real Godzilla battles with the Americanized Zilla, who is handily defeated in less than 20 seconds, constituting the shortest monster battle in any Godzilla title. Number 53. Of course, Hollywood doesn't always get it wrong, and in 2014, Legendary Entertainment released another reboot also called Godzilla, which was far better received than the 1998 train wreck. In the film, Godzilla's face was partially modeled on an eagle in order to give the monster a noble aesthetic. Number 54. Still, you can't please everyone, and many Japanese fans thought the 2014 Godzilla design was, and to quote, too fat. Wow, we're going there, are we, Japan? We thought you were better than that. Number 55. Despite being the title character, Godzilla only appears on screen in the film for a total of 11 minutes, which almost feels like a ripoff. Almost. Number 56. Incidentally, the 2014 reboot was the first Godzilla movie to feature an Academy Award winner in the form of Juliette Binoche as Sandra Brody. It is also the first Godzilla film to star any Oscar-nominated actresses and actors since 1965, when Nick Adams starred in Invasion of Astro Monster, having been nominated for Best Supporting Actor a couple of years earlier for the 1963 film The Charge is Murder. Number 57. Acclaimed American film director Quentin Tarantino. Uh, excuse you. Acclaimed American film director Quentin Tarantino admitted to crying during Sandra Brody's heart-wrenching death scene, stating it was the first time I've ever cried during a 3D blockbuster. He added that he actually had to remove his 3D glasses to wipe away the tears. And number 58. The upcoming 2019 Godzilla offering, entitled Godzilla King of the Monsters, is a sequel to Legendary's 2014 Godzilla, and will constitute the third film in Legendary's MonsterVerse, along with the 2017 film Kong Skull Island. Wow, everyone seems to really love franchises and shared universes right now. I wonder what caused that? Number 59. The film is believed to feature a range of other Toho-era monsters set to star alongside Godzilla, as the trailer also seems to feature cameos from a crab-like monster believed to be Kamonga and a big guy emerging from under a mountain, who's thought to be the previously mentioned spiky boy, Anguirus. No word on whether Jennifer Lawrence will be making an appearance, but don't worry, we'll keep you updated. Number 60. In King of the Monsters, the much-loved Mothra was designed to resemble real moths and given longer legs in order to better defend herself against other monsters. We got you, Mothra. We got you. Number 61. Godzilla King of the Monsters is the first Hollywood-made movie to include the three-headed beast that is King Ghidorah, first appearing in 1964 in the fifth film in the Godzilla series, Ghidorah the Three-Headed Monster. Ghidorah appeared as Godzilla's arch nemesis throughout the Toho movies, and will continue its love of getting right under Godzilla's skin throughout the MonsterVerse. Number 62. In its original incarnation, Ghidorah was a diabolical space monster that obliterated life on numerous planets throughout the universe. While the MonsterVerse may disregard parts of the Ghidorah's past, Ghidorah's space origin appears to be confirmed. Number 63. In March of 2019, Producer Alex Garcia appeared to be less definitive about the three-headed dragon's origins, stating that only Ghidorah is not part of the natural order. Oh, nice little rhyming couplet there. Nintendo reference. Based on a TV spot for the upcoming film, the MonsterVerse is believed to contain at least 17 monsters, stated by Ken Watanabe's character, Dr. Ishido Serizawa, with the words 17 and counting. Oh, oh Lord, they're coming! Oh, they're coming! Oh, Lord, they're coming! Number 65. In 2019's Godzilla King of the Monsters, Bradley Whitford plays Dr. Stanton, a scientist who is apparently loosely inspired by Rick Sanchez from Rick and Morty. Number 66. Today, the Godzilla franchise is almost as big as the guy himself, with between 34 or 37 films, depending on how you count them. That's 32 Toho-produced Japanese offerings, three of which were heavily edited and re-released as new American entries to the franchise, and two Hollywood originals. 
Well, one wasn't very original at all, but you know. If you count the American re-releases as separate, that's 37, with two or more American entries slated for 2019 and 2020. Number 67. Back when Captain America was barely an ice cube, Godzilla was pioneering one of the world's first cinematic universes throughout the 50s and 60s. Entries like Mothra, Rodan, The Mysterians, and Varan the Unbelievable all featured characters who eventually interacted with one another in later movies, which maintain their narratives across multiple entries and produce expansive cinematic universes. Number 68. Several new franchises were spawned to capitalize on the kaiju boom of the 1960s, which was constituted by films featuring giant monsters. One of the most notable examples was the Ultraman series, which saw the eponymous hero face up against numerous oversized beasties, which, owing to its limited budget, were usually spray-painted costumes from other monster flicks. Godzilla made an unofficial appearance as Juras, who was literally just Godzilla with a frill around his neck. Groundbreaking. Number 69. The international distribution of the Godzilla movies during the 60s and 70s led to some bizarre foreign titles and posters. For instance, Germany went through a phase of only releasing monster films if they inexplicably featured Frankenstein. So, Son of Godzilla became Frankenstein's monster hunts Godzilla's son, and all German releases of monster films were edited to include lines establishing that the titular beasts were in fact created by Dr. Frankenstein. Number 70. <laughs> okay, let's take this opportunity to put some popular Godzilla myths to rest once and for all. Firstly, Godzilla does not and never has eaten people. It isn't entirely clear what or how Godzilla eats, or even if he eats at all, and many subscribe to the view that the creature absorbs radiation for sustenance, but even that is subject to speculation and changes from film to film. However, one thing is absolutely certain. Godzilla does not eat humans. Number 71. Somewhat predictably, Godzilla is almost universally thought of and referred to as male, and so it therefore may come as a surprise that Godzilla's sex hasn't been definitively confirmed one way or the other. In the Japanese Godzilla films, Godzilla is referred to with gender-neutral pronouns like it, while the American dubs and the 2014 reboot specifically refer to Godzilla with male pronouns like he and him. Number 72. The fact that Godzilla has produced offspring and guarded nests at various points throughout the franchise only causes further confusion. Some even believe that Godzilla reproduces asexually, which is actually stated in the 1998 reboot by Dr. Totopoulos, played by Matthew Broderick. Number 73. Contrary to the popular belief and some badly coloured posters, Godzilla is not green, except once in the 23rd film Godzilla 2000 Millennium, but it was actually grey. He was probably mostly grey in the original film because that was black and white, although the actual suit was brown. Colour me confused. Number 74. Another common misconception is that Godzilla breathes fire, but this couldn't be further from the truth. While Godzilla does have a breath-based weapon, it is not fire, and is in fact concentrated radiation often referred to as atomic breath. Easy mistake to make, but still, definitely not a fire breather. Number 75. During the big guy's first outing in the original 1954 film, he wasn't actually that big, clocking in at a measly 50 meters tall. Since then, his height has jumped up and down, hitting 80 meters in the 80s reboot, then 100 meters in the 90s, before shrinking back down to 55 meters for his early noughties outings. Number 76. Godzilla's last three cinematic forays have each seen the Titan hit his tallest height yet. 2014's 108-meter Godzilla was tipped by Japan's Shin Godzilla in 2016, but the one-upmanship is set to continue in 2019's Godzilla King of the Monsters, ooh, which will feature a simply excessive 120-meter Godzilla. That's ignoring the 2017 anime trilogy Godzilla Planet of the Monsters, which featured a 300-meter monster who's honestly just compensating for something at this point. Number 77. If Kong had stuck to his original 1933 height, he probably could have been stepped on when he fought Godzilla. To make it more even, he was considerably scaled up from a meager 5.5 meter height to a competitive 45 meters for the 1962 face off with the 50 meter Zilla. This is a lot of facts about height. Number 78. Though Godzilla's strengths and weaknesses vary between appearances, the monster's most consistent vulnerability appears to be ice, which cartels its rampant destruction on several occasions throughout the film series. For instance, Godzilla was frozen for a number of years in Godzilla Raids Again, and Godzilla was forced into hibernation by a man-made snowstorm in Son of Godzilla, while Burning Godzilla was frozen by the Japanese military in Godzilla vs. Destroyer. Number 79! <laughs> 
If Godzilla had been a giant octopus as originally intended, you can't imagine what his 1992 night commercial would have looked like. In the ad, the big guy went on what can only be described as a terroristic rampage playing basketball against Charles Barkley. Godzilla ultimately lost, but New York was the real loser as the two giant ballers walked off into the sunset, destroying cars and buildings as they went. What a magnificent spectacle. Number 80. Uh. If your thought art facts about that bizarre commercial ended there, you are woefully mistaken. Incredibly, the ad in question, which again featured Godzilla wearing trendy glasses and shooting hoops, was later adapted into a comic book. Because seriously, what wasn't in the 90s? Are we alive? Number 81. Godzilla's career as a 100-foot sellout also saw him shill for Dr. Pepper and Snickers. I also feel like he was definitely the Chewit dinosaur, but that's for the lawyers to decide. Number 82. Speaking of which one company Godzilla definitely did not endorse was Subway, who found themselves on the end of a lawsuit from Toho Studios for their unlicensed use of the Godzilla character in their commercials. Number 83. In 2008, Godzilla also appeared with his smaller reptilian son, Manila, in a charming PSA that was created by the Ad Council to promote positive fatherhood. You know what they say, families that demolish human cities and wreak untold terror and destruction together, stay together. Number 84. Few other beings could destroy large parts of a city and still earn themselves a citizenship, especially while being entirely fictional. But Godzilla not only earned that accolade, but was also named as a tourism ambassador for the Tokyo district of Shinjuku in 2015. Number 85! 2015 was a big year for the Big Lizard. It also saw the opening of the world's first and only Godzilla-themed hotel. Hotel Grace Sui Shinjuku features a 12-meter Godzilla head built into the structure of the building, looking into six of the rooms. Number 86. I like Godzilla. Japanese baseball legend Hideki Matsui is also known as Godzilla, a nickname that originally began as an insulting reference to skin problems he had early on in his career. However, the name has now come to represent his powerful hitting, because screw the haters. Number 87. Living up to his nickname, Matsui even had a blink and you'll miss it cameo in the 26th Godzilla film, which was released in 2002 under the fantastically titled Godzilla vs. Mecha Godzilla. Godzilla fighting a robot Godzilla. Instant classic. Number 88. However, Godzilla's cameo in Pee Wee's Big Adventure was entirely unlicensed and unauthorized, and Toho being Toho, sued Warner Bros. for an undisclosed sum. Number 89. In the 1997 sequel to Jurassic Park, entitled The Lost World Jurassic Park, there is a scene in which a ferocious Tyrannosaurus Rex rampages through the city of San Diego. At one point, a group of Japanese tourists running from the T-Rex can be heard screaming in their native language, I left Japan to get away from this! An obvious reference to Godzilla. Number 90. In the city of Zilla in Washington, there's a church where the locals go to worship a guy named God? Is that? Don't know. Said church is therefore blessed with the confusing title of The Church of God, Zilla. And although it was founded decades prior to the first film, they've still decided to humour the coincidence with a steel dinosaur statue behind the church, complete with his own cross. Every creationist's nightmare. Number 91. In March of 1992, one of the monster's costumes, which was worth a staggering $39,000, was stolen from Toho's special effects apartment only to be found washed up on the shores of Lake Okutama, near Tokyo, several weeks later, where it apparently scared the life out of an older lady who'd gone out for a stroll. I shouldn't laugh at that, but it's kind of funny. <laughs> Number 92. In the mid-60s, there were plans to put together one of the most ambitious crossovers in cinematic history, Batman vs. Godzilla. The film, which would have starred the wonderful Adam West, was proposed by Japanese screenwriter Shinichi Sakizawa, but sadly was never produced. Number 93. However, Godzilla did get the opportunity to do battle with everyone's favourite group of superheroes and best friends, the Avengers. Between 1977 and 1979, Marvel ran a 24-issue series featuring the Big G, in which he also squared off against the Fantastic Four. Number 94. Thankfully, boffins have concluded that a real-life Godzilla wouldn't be much of a threat. Paleontologist Mike P. Taylor crunched the numbers and figured out that the limb cartilage in a Godzilla-sized animal would be crushed under its own body weight, like overripe watermelons. Number 95. 
Not only that, a real-life full-size Godzilla would have a range of other problems, including overheating, extremely slow reaction times, and the fact that if it were to fall over, as it has several times throughout its career fighting human armies and various other monsters, it would almost certainly die. The force incurred by tens of thousands of tons of rampaging monster falling to the ground would apparently be so massive that Godzilla would probably explode on impact. Watch your step there, dude. Number 96. Still, we do have the next best thing. After paleontologist Kenneth Carpenter discovered and named Gojirasaurus in 1997, the new dinosaur was one of the largest carnivores of the Triassic period and was fittingly named after the fictional beast one year before Roland Emmerich's Godzilla film effectively put Godzilla back in the ground for a while. Number 97. I bought the blah blah blah. In 1996, Patrick Stewart presented Godzilla with a Lifetime Achievement Award at the MTV Movie Awards, stating, We've all heard about his temper, about the people he stepped on, on his way to the top. Number 98. Godzilla has also earned a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame after being inducted in 2004 to commemorate his 50th birthday. See, I knew Godzilla and Anne Hathaway had something in common. Number 99. Point 99.9 In the Kurehama Flower Park in the Japanese city of Yokosuka, there is a three-story Godzilla statue that doubles as a playground slide for kids. While much fun is to be had sliding down Zilla's tail, unfortunately the entrance to the slide requires kids to walk into the monster's open crotch. Amazingly, Toho Studios actually oversaw the slide construction, so I guess it's official. Happy sliding, kiddos! <laughs> Number 100. Godzilla has lent his likeness to a host of merchandise, varying in quality about as much as his films have, and including items such as figurines, shoes, lighters, watches, plush dolls, bags, and collectible coinage. Some much stranger highlights include a toy tricycle being ridden by Godzilla and his much maligned son, Manila, and two, that's right, two Godzilla vs. Mothra ashtrays, both of which can be yours for just $90. Number 101! <laughs> Harmonies. <laughs> In 1978, now deceased North Korean dictator Kim Jong il kidnapped the respected South Korean film director Shin Sang gok and his then wife Choi Yun hee and forced them to make films that would depict North Korea in a positive light to the rest of the world. The final and most expensive of these films was called Pulgasari, involving a giant reptilian monster who helps an oppressed Korean population rise up against an evil king. Apparently, Kim Jong-il did not possess a particularly keen sense of irony. So that was 100 more facts about Godzilla. Did you learn anything new? Do you think Godzilla's diet should be solely potatoes? Because I sure do. Let us know in the comments down below. Also, while you're down there, let us know what you like and make sure you do say that you do like me in Georgia because that means a lot. Speaking of Georgia, make sure to check out All Time Movies where you can hear Georgia's beautiful voice all the time discussing more facts about your favorite movies. Also, give us a like and make sure you subscribe to the channel and ding that bell so you get to know when we make a video because how else are you gonna know? YouTube doesn't tell people now anymore apparently, so... Uh, look what's on screen right now! Oh, look at these videos! Aren't they snazzy? Yes, they are! Click on one. Bye. Godzilla, Godzilla, Godzilla! Godzilla, Godzilla, Godzilla! Godzilla, Godzilla, Godzilla! Godzilla, Godzilla, Godzilla!